Today I'm talking to Mala and you are a co-principal at the Tampere uh, Philharmonic and we have the of you have the the Tampere flute fest coming up so um, we thought it's nice to have a conversation because you have a very interesting program coming up and uh, you're also a PhD student with a very interesting topic so um, that's for what we are going to talk about but I read that you start playing the flute at age of nine. Is it true? Yes, that's true. Uh, back in the day when I was starting out, I, I already wanted to start playing the flute at the age of, age of seven, maybe. But it wasn't allowed because in Finland they thought it would be wiser to learn to play the recorder or another sort of smaller size instrument. Because and I was and I still am rather small. I'm I'm not the tallest person. So for me, I played two years of the recorder from age seven up until nine, and then I was sort of allowed to change to flute. Okay. So so you played the recorder before you played the flute? And um, did you have a, a musical family, your parents or maybe siblings? Or... My family, uh, my mom has had piano lessons, and, and she also sang in a choir growing up. And my family, I guess they're musical, but I'm not, I was not born into a musical family. Instead, my father is a photographer. He's now retired and he's also worked in journalism. And, and he has this sort of like visual arts kind of thing. It's more of his field. So I'm, I'm on the other side. So let's say that we're an artistic family, but not professionally. Okay. Okay, but it was inspiring, uh, probably, and you you did hear music around you uh, when you were growing up. Yes, absolutely. My my family is a big music listener, and not only limiting to classical or other genres, but really widespread. So I think that was a useful thing, and they were really keen on taking me to music lessons. So I've always had the sort of support that you need from early on to progress in your studies. Okay, and who, who inspired you as a young flute player? I think the very first flute recording that I got was by James Galway. Mm -hmm. And I believe the title was The Man with the Golden Flute. And it's a it's a real show, showbiz showcase of a CD, the collection of all the greatest hits that you could imagine. And I remember there's a recording of the Doppler Hungarian Fantasy. On that, and I think that was the thing that did it for me because I was like, man, a guy can play really fast, and that's really amazing. So yes, James, James, Sir James Galway, my biggest inspiration. Okay, and and are there other uh, musicians, not flute players, that inspired you as a young flute player, or just? Mm. That's a really good question, actually. I think not at really early age. I used to listen to a lot of CDs. We had different on LPs, the Deutsche Grammophon, this this yellow label series. So I, I think I just for fun, I played a lot of symphonies by different orchestras and different conductors. So I think it was just the, the sort of general atmosphere of, of having an orchestra around oneself. That was the thing for me. Okay, so, so in the early age, the orchestra already um excited you when you listen to it so yes and it did and it was something that was always really intriguing i'm i'm from a rather small city myself so we didn't have a big music school so we didn't have a symphony orchestra uh, or a wind orchestra those things started maybe a bit later on when i was already sort of further in my studies but then uh, i went to high school in 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 the capital of finland in helsinki uh, it was the school that was specialized in music, and there we had a full-size symphony orchestra for the students that you needed to apply to, like to audition for, to get a place in. And I was fortunate enough to 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 make make it on the sort of list already during my first year there. So that was, of course, a big game changer. And during those years, I also changed because I had to move to Helsinki because of the school. I changed to another music school, and it so happened that I. I was studying with this teacher, not in Helsinki, but in Espoo, and they had a, it's a really big music school, and they had a large orchestra, and they, they were doing Tchaikovsky Fourth, 
during the year that I officially changed to their lists and um, they needed a piccolo player. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I was the lucky one. So yeah, I think I, I played the Chike for the piccolo part at the age of 17, 18. And no one told, nobody told me that it was difficult. So I managed it somehow. And of course, when you're 18, you can do anything. If no one tells you that you need to actually fix this in this business, and they were just happy to have someone not to break down in the middle of performance. So, yeah. So I think that was like, because I I've I've played the piccolo loads, and I still love it a lot. So maybe it was my sort of positive experience on playing Chike Fourth way too young, that has kept a love for the instrument alive for all these years. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, you studied in Helsinki, the flute, and, and then you, you went to London. Uh, was there a particular reason you, you went to London? Mm, I wanted to do an Erasmus exchange as part of my studies. Mm. And I've always been a big Anglophile. I've, I, have the, I have a love for the language and, and in, in a sense also for the culture. Um, I visited England before during my high school years on a language course during two summers. So it felt sort of natural to try to aim to go to London. So my options pretty much were Chicago or London and, and the spots opened up in, in Guildhall School of Music and Drama. And so that's where I went. Not mainly because, or not only because of the flute playing, but also I think it's useful for young people to keep in mind that life is also for living. And if you want to do an Erasmus exchange, it should have like other perks, or not only maybe just a teacher, but to, to choose a place where you can see you're fitted in culturally and what excites you. Mm. Yeah, that's a great advice. Yeah. And your teachers, um, you, you had lessons with Ian Clark, I, I read. Um, um, how, how was it to have lessons with him? He's such a fun guy, so laid back, and he was always like, jingle just trying to relax and he really opened up the whole sort of my career path towards playing loads of contemporary music because he was I'd say he was the one who introduced all of the extended techniques for the first time to me in a really sort of progressive way an organized way of course I like stumbled upon playing contemporary repertoire before and, and my teachers would always advise me on doing stuff that was in in the music but he was like, okay, so this is what we're going to do now. And that was a big eye opener, a really useful lesson. And what I also love about his music is that he's sort of, because I think that when, when you think about contemporary flute music, you always have this idea of something being really sort of analytical or mathematical, even really theoretical and sounding futuristic or harsh even. And his pieces are the total opposite of that. It's really, it comes from your soul and, and it's really romantic. And still he's using all of the most rebellious extended techniques simultaneous. Yes, do, do you have a favorite piece by him? I love the Zoom tube, mostly because of the, the beatboxing and everything and the screaming. <laughs> so the screaming on stage is always like, after you've done the scream, then it's like, okay, whatever comes next it's fine yeah. and it's such a big hit with the audience yeah, it's it's a lot of acting involved as well i think mm. it's a it's a piece to perform in in so many levels not just to play but to perform okay as a um, as a student is there um is there one thing well what, what you learned as a student that you would advise to other students or the, the thing you um, I, I remember once one, one particular quote when I was studying in, in Guildhall and one of my teachers there was Sarah Newbold and she, she had a big impact on me and, and my playing as well. And her advice simply was to smile with your eyes when you're playing, to let the emotion show because we, we cannot, as we would as actors be able to gesture things were sort of stuck behind the instrument, but you can do so many things with your eyes. And that's, that's, and I think that's a really useful piece of advice 
for all of us to keep in mind while we're playing. It's all always about making the contact and, and making the audience want to hear you play more. Um, another super useful tip I got when I was, I believe I maybe have already finished my studies, but I was going for an audition and there was this London-based clarinet player visiting Finland, Matt Hunt, who's an amazing player. Uh, he was in Finland because he was doing some production with, with a friend of mine for their string quartet. And so we met just for a casual dinner out, maybe a beer out the night before I was leaving for this big audition. And he told me to have fun. It's a really simple piece of advice, but the way he brought it out, he, he said that if you go to auditions and you, you listen to the candidates, you're sitting in the jury, there are so many people who are like so, not even maybe stressed, their level of performance might be up, it's good. But everyone is sort of concerned. And what people most forget is to have fun. And now that I, I have a permanent job with an orchestra and I get to, I get to listen to our auditions, and it, it really is true. You can hear the people who sort of allow for themselves still to have fun, even while auditioning for important jobs or, or like big life changing events. And yeah, that's just something that you should always keep in mind. I think that the reason why we compete in this instrument or in this industry is that we have the love for playing and we should always, always try to let it show. Yeah, well, for you, it worked. You you are now co-principal, <laughs> <laughs> so so that's fantastic. Uh, and, and and how many years are you playing in the orchestra uh, now? I did loads of freelancing during maybe almost ten years before winning this permanent job, which happened in two thousand and sixteen. So so to me, the place that the job still feels rather new because after. After that, I started in the autumn of 2016, and then I've taken some time off for my PhD studies, and I also had a child. So, so for the last year, for example, I was on a study leave. So it always feels nice to have a place to come come back to, and I'm sort of even now waiting for. Of course, it's really important to take time for your family and your own projects, but I'm waiting for after this pandemic starts to clear out that maybe I will get sort of a bit bored of the job i still i'm not but i'm hoping i'm looking forward to the feeling where i feel like okay i've sat here for long enough in a way i wait for it and then don't yeah okay what do you like most about playing in the orchestra i love the non-verbal communication i love the small gestures i like the sort of silences between the notes that can tell so much and that is something that you cannot mimic in any way or that's the thing that you cannot replace if we're if we're stuck in this reality of only streaming concerts and not having a live audience it's it's been a useful in in a way useful year to learn about mm, about performing to a room with no audience as well i played my second doctorate concert in the end of last November and the pandemic started to to cause a lot of restrictions like one week before my my designated concert date so we weren't allowed any people in the concert hall except for the members few members of my jury there were four of them in the hall and then a few musicians, musicians on stage with me fortunately and you notice when you play a full length concert program to a hall of basically no audience that you start to miss the sort of, of course, it, in a way it feels easier to go on stage because you don't have the, oh my God, what are they thinking of me? Or oh, now, they're, now they're judging me because I have a jury. That sort of edge from the beginning of the performance, you get to leave that out. But as you progress, you really need that feedback from the audience. It would be super useful to have someone, so enough people so that you can see that there's people there. 
So I miss that. And I'm looking forward to getting to play to a full house again sometime soon. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So you, you talked a little bit about your PhD. Um, can, can you tell about the topic? And, and you have, I, uh, if I'm correct, you have five recitals. Mm. Um, how, how, does it, how does it work? I'm, I'm attending the Doctorate of Music uh, in Artistic Research program for the Sibelius Academy the Doctoral Department. And our program, it's, it's a five-year program in total. Um, so we, we, as you mentioned, we play five full-length recitals and for which we have this joint plan of a thing. The research that I'm conducting at the moment is about the, uh, about the flutist performance identity and through the narrativity of music. So basically I've chosen for my repertoire, I've chosen the program of the latter half of the 1900th century and up until modern era. Some older pieces as well, but this is sort of the main focus. The age of Jolivet and, and, and the likes. And I have different themes for each of my concerts. The first one was about the nature and bird motifs that we hear so often in flute, flute music. The second one was uh, about religious and spiritual themes. In the following one, I'm sort of looking into the use of one's voice as a speaking voice, singing voice, thus the extended techniques. And, um, and also about the, the, the flute voice, which, which makes us individual, unique performance. Um, and, then, and then there's two more, but I won't go on babbling or ever. Uh, we also, we write these big theses. I'm now doing my first one about the, um, it's about the questions of the identity and body in playing contemporary flute rep repertoire. And it steals its title from, there's an alto flute solo piece called Yuta number one by Esa-Pekka Salonen, where Salonen himself, who's now much more famous as a conductor, but he's also done a lot of compositions. Um, he advises, if I remember correctly, it's Tangram that he advises and he writes, kiss the instrument. So I'm, I'm using that rather romantic, emotional <laughs> piece advice or performance instructions as, as my title, because I think it's, it, it sort of summarizes so much about how much difference there is in the way that composers guide us towards the uh, the pre preferred acoustic result in their pieces and how much variation and how much emotion there is and how much how i perceive things affects the performance yeah very interesting yeah how, how does it affect you r right now it does it affect you already or um your research and thinking of this topic? It does actually, because everything right now is nicely. Uh, I've done, of course, you read a lot to do research. I read theses by other people, other flute players. I check out some pretty useful websites for extended techniques such as yours. And I'm trying to collect some sort of like a, a collective idea about how the extended techniques right now are being talked about and how they're being taught to people and also how the narrative that we use uh, while talking about contemporary stuff or the sort of traditional flute sound stuff how it affects us because it's this this narrative this whole thing like in which light do we present the flute sound and all the different possibilities that one can have in making different colors and bringing our personality into the performance and, and in pieces of different eras and different styles. Because sometimes when you, when you consider your academic training, we all go to conservatory and we need to sort of reach a certain level and it has to happen. But sometimes hand in hand with that, I feel I, or I have this fear that we're sort of limiting ourselves to accepting only this one idea of 
perfect sound. Whereas at yet at the same time, there's not just one perfect sound. But I, but what I fear and what I think that sometimes happened to me during my studies, especially, was that I was aiming for a, a sound that I maybe didn't have in my own ear as much as I had the sort of feeling that I should be doing something because my teachers are telling me to do this and this and this. And then you sort of have this like it's a blank canvas here when you don't, if you don't have in your ear what you're looking for, instead of just giving this advice of how to think about the embouchure and stuff, and then you maybe get a bit lost. So what I want to do with presenting extended techniques is also to broaden the sort of idea that we have about the flute sound, because personally, I don't, of course, we need the term extended techniques, but all in all, it should be just flute playing. There shouldn't be like, there's the flute sound and then there's the modern flute sound. It's it's all the same instrument. It's all part of the, like different petals on the same one beautiful flower. And of course, maybe it's not the wisest idea to go crazy with your sound if you're playing Mozart at an orchestra audition, but <laughs> you can use those things. You can afterwards in concerts when it, when you're not being sort of having to be like make it to second round in somewhere or, or whatever. It's, it's a nice way to put your own character. We all use sort of, when, when you reach third register, for instance, we all use sort of fake fingerings or quarter note fingerings or whatever to make our lives easier. And we, we get by with them. And sometimes I, I feel that maybe we should broaden the sense of flute play that we are more, to, more allowed to play around with them yeah well well said <laughs> yeah, beautiful but do you that was a long talk <laughs> well it was very nice <laughs> and i totally agree <laughs> yeah, so um do you do you think uh, we use the extended te techniques more than than we are um than we know you you told about uh, the the alternative fingerings well we can call that an extended technique so so do you think it's possible most flute players who are not comfortable yet with uh, playing uh, extended techniques do use them, but not knowing it. I think if, if you're looking for different colors, because what we usually hear from our teachers or in the feedbacks of our exams, it's always like, make more color. How do you make more color? You find a different resonance, you find the different registers playing differently, you add some air, you lose some air so the timbre that for instance in Kaya Saria house music it's so she's always she's most interested in if I summarize it and just based on my feeling that what interests her is the the point where you you have the sort of sound sound and then the air and it's like where those two sort of opposite sound ideals or different op opposing sounds where do they clash and I think in general, we, we all do clash. If you play in an orchestra, you need to blend more than you just fade your own sound out. And, and we do. I, I would claim that we all use much more extended techniques in our everyday lives than we, we would like to admit. Do you think we should, we should uh, start teaching those techniques early in uh, flute studies, for example, with children already? Or because you said, um, while studying, it's 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 like this. I experienced the same uh, when studying the flute. But um, yeah, what, what what do you think about teaching these techniques to children? I absolutely do that. They should be introduced like small doses, because all sorts of tongue clicks, key clicks you can do at a very early age already. Kids love learning to do the tongue ram, for instance, and at least in, in my training in, in the conservatory, some of them were used to sort of tackle problems in the, the forming of the tone, like whistle tones. You cannot produce a whistle tone un unless your face is relaxed enough. And also this singing and playing thing, when you can learn to sort of activate the throat while you're playing, you can maybe also, as you mentioned on, your, on, on one of your blog texts on your website, is like when you learn 
to how to do something, then you can also learn how to choose not to do it. And I think that's a really, really, really clever piece of advice. And so all sorts of like really small bits and tricks have been used before. And using extended techniques, I think it makes playing with the instrument easier. Kids love different sounds. We all love to play around and just like trying to find new things. And also the easiest of the multiphonics, like where you push the F and then the two drill keys to make that. That's pretty easy to make. And and of course you should bring all, all the different sounds and, and techniques at a really early age. Yes, yeah. Did you, um, when you when you learned these techniques, was it hard for you to learn them or was it just, you just did it? Of course, it's, it's, you have to think about stuff differently. For instance, for multiphonics, you sometimes, you need to write that stuff down and you need to sort of find your own way how to do it. And I think one of the biggest question marks for playing contemporary repertoire still is that you, there's not one unified way, one, there's not a universal way of like marking down things. But then you have the advantage of being able to work with the composers. So sometimes when you have a composer who's still well and alive and they like to come to the rehearsals already before the concert, and then you can look at, hey, can I ask you this? What do you actually, what is exactly what you mean? I mean, because now the way that you've written sort of like this and this effect down, to me, I translate it this way. And to me, it would sound like this. And it maybe it doesn't work on my instrument. And then maybe you can have a discussion and then the composer can tell you exactly what it is and you can try out different things together. And then you can have sort of an effect on the future of flute music. And you can tell the composer that, okay, if, if you want this kind of sound, I would maybe write it down this way. And then maybe, okay, that's a much more intelligent way of like simple way to put it. So that's why I also feel that it's super important for the people who are active on the scene to be active on the new music scene as well, because we sort of get to not make the future, but we get to guide the way that things are being written in the future. Yes, so um, this, this make me, make me, makes me th uh, think you also play in the contemporary music ensemble. I have to try to pronounce it uh, the right way. Uh, Usinta. Yes, Usinta. Usinta uh, ensemble. Um, and on the website, I, I read, I have, to, I have to read it. The ensemble sees it as its main mission to bring the most exciting composers from all countries um, to its concert in Helsinki and, and beyond. And that made me um, think, and maybe this is, this is what we are talking about now. What makes a composer really exciting? When is the music really exciting? Mm. To me, the most exciting, and this is just my personal view and not the ensembles maybe, um, I think as a contemporary composer, one needs to sort of acknowledge and appreciate the past, but still be sort of wanting actively to break out from the scene that's already there. Of course, you don't need to sort of feel the need of like wanting to invent the wheel once again, if some things work and they work and, and but then to have some sort of individual stamp on the thing that you're writing. And right now, the composers that we've worked with during the recent years, um, I think melanging different genres, I would like to see the future of the Western art music as of not being, because we, we tend to think that, that orchestra music and opera music in general, it's something that's already in a museum. Mm -hmm. And I find that, I find that idea a bit funny, yet I still somehow feel that we also love to put ourselves in that sort of box. And then we have the division between Western art music and pop music and jazz and, and I would love to see more of an interaction between those two different different things. Um, Sebastian Hill is one of Finnish composers who's doing a great job. He's 
mixing elements of acid jazz, for instance, in his classical contemporary pieces, which is a, it, it brings out a crazy result. And I think one also should never feel afraid to ask crazy things from your performers. So to be brave enough, if it's, I mean, yeah, to do two things that are outside sort of the traditional box, it's useful for the players as well. And personally, I feel that one of the things that, well, maybe it's been in 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 the contemporary scene for for years already, but different textures of sound, not just because it it's it used to be about the harmony and the melodic progression, and maybe at some point about the rhythm, and now maybe together with all the spectrum harmonies and everything is about the sound color or the, or the texture. People are doing a lot of things with really grainy surfaces in a way that when you when you listen to the piece it's it's there's a lot of like friction going on yet to combine with this like sort of, of silky or smoother textures and that's what interests me the most. Okay how, how do you think um... How, how does it work with the audience? There are a lot of audience of people in audiences are not used to, to the contemporary um, music. And uh, do you feel we uh, should introduce it or and just let it happen? Or how can we how can we help the audience to understand contemporary music? That's a really good question. Um, we just started out this um, with Uusinta. We're doing a big project called the Modern Classic, where we're starting with the serialists like Stockhausen and um, Boulez and stuff. And we're doing visual visualizations like in animation about the how they use the series of, of different tones and how they're brought out in the music. So comp if, if you want to explain this sort of mathematical analytical thing to your audience, maybe it's use, use, really useful to bring visual aids. I don't think that the classical music scene should be afraid of taking advantage of doing visualizations as well. Um, but I, I think that as in terms of educating one's audience towards contemporary music, it's to start bringing again smaller doses on smaller children because i remember playing this like kindergarten and elementary school concerts with with a small orchestra group years and years ago and i what we found there was that the kids who are still like six seven and eight they're like okay whichever music if it grooves if it makes you dance it's 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 super cool and it makes them dance. But then by the age when they reach like nine or 10, it's like something clicks in their head that they've been told by someone, by an authority, like, like the parents or maybe bigger kids or something saying that classical music is boring. And then they're like, oh, this is so, I cannot even. And you can really see the change that it, it, it goes from, from one age group to another. And I, I'm, I'm slightly afraid that if, if we sort of advertise the contemporary music as like, okay, and now you need to really understand all this theoretical analytical stuff that's in the structure of the piece, that people will be like, oh, I just want to relax. I want to go and go to a concert and just enjoy and relax. I don't want to have to think about stuff too much, which I totally understand. So maybe we should try to, <laughs> like move the narrative towards the towards the direction that we would talk about the the emotional and the interpretational qualities of contemporary music as well because what i feel in so many flute pieces is that the extender techniques are not there to create a sort of contemporary modern or artificial sound rather they're used to bring us sort of back to nature, more to the wooden flute sound and more to this sort of native naturalistic world of having more air in the sound and like, yeah, more nature. So maybe we should talk about the, the, um, the program in the music or the inspiration behind the piece and the emotion it brings much more. 
Yeah, nice. So maybe a bit of you of uh, humor of uh, sometimes uh, mm. help too. <laughs> if if it exactly yes fits the piece, of course. That's true because there's there's so much humor in classical and uh, this contemporary scene as well. It's not all just like really super serious and important stuff. Yeah. Of course, no. Um, you you are giving a, a lecture concert at the uh, Tampere Flute Fest. It will be on the twenty fourth and twenty fifth of April. It's a live event, is it? I, I was told it's a live event, or is it via um, internet? Uh, so far, at this stage, we're still hoping to make it a live event. Mm. Fingers crossed that we will be. But I'm I'm sure that there will be a streaming option as well. But if we can bring in audience that would be so fingers crossed that the situation eases up a bit yes and can you tell a bit more about your lecture your lecture concert is it a part of your phd program um, yes this is my this is a very lovely chance to sort of pr uh, present my the, the work that i'm doing for my phd and combine it with the sort of active concert life here in Tampere. Uh, so my it's it's going to be a shortish lecture performance, and maybe emphasis on the performance and not so so much on the on the lecture. But I will be playing pieces by Sari Ahok, uh, and also by Andrew Ford. Uh, he's an Australian composer, uh, coincidentally married to a Finn, and I'm I'm playing his wonderfully titled solo alto flute piece called Female Nude on stage, um, fully clothed, so, so. And also I will be presenting at least a bit of Brian Fernieho's Cassandra's Dream Song, just to give a, because it makes a nice example of what you're sort of faced with when you want to start to get into contemporary repertoire and why one should not be scared of it. Yeah. Although it can, it can look a bit complicated. Yeah, it's quite intimidating the the, the score of, of the piece. It's it's a monolith, and and he's he's make he's making it difficult for all parties on purpose, and I think that's that's part of the charm. Mm, yeah, can you tell a little bit more about uh, the pieces? What are they about? Um, um, for example, uh, I'm gonna play Kaya Sari has laconism del, uh, which is the the laconism of the of the wing. And it starts with this really, really beautiful poem recited by the flautist on stage. And the poem is by Saint Jean Ders. And after it's the whole piece is about the sort of changes of the different timbres of the sound and changing from using one's speaking voice to the flute voice and loads of extended techniques and it's a mix and match kind of piece where you have to find your own in because the way she's written it, it's sometimes not the easiest to produce all these different effects at once. And so you really need to find your own way to sort of bring it all together and, and to bring it all out to the audience as well. It's a really, really lovely classic piece in our contemporary repertoire. Uh, and this this alto flute solo by by Andrew Ford, it also uses the speaking voice mixed with the alto flute sound with different vowels and different uh, some consonants even, and singing and playing all together at once. And I I just I'm a big fan of the the side instruments as I mentioned before. I have a love for the piccolo playing and also for the alto flute. So I'm excited to bring out that as well, because the alto flute as a solo instrument is something that you don't often get to hear. So I'm using this opportunity now. Yeah, fantastic. Some some of the cont contemporary pieces, you you have to wear a, um, a specific clothes. Is it, is it the same with this piece? Or can you just wear your concert dress? Or... This is something that I, I will be wearing, just, just my concert dress. Um, Later on, for my third doctorate recital in the beginning of June, we'll be doing um, George Crumb's Vox Ballet and I, uh, The Song of the Whale. And there you have, it's, co <laughs> this is sort of like, the piece will turn 50 this year. And it will be 50 years from its first performance in, in 
I think, April in 21. No, 22, something like that. Anyways, um, and it's, it's a three or four, three masked players. So how that is, of course, Crumb gave these specific um, instructions on how everyone should wear a visi or some sort of like an eye mask of thing. But now during this day and age that we're forced to use the face mask in a different sense, one has to think, should we just cover the whole face or how should we, how should we be doing it? Um, but maybe let's see if we can use the lights in the hall for the festival to try and create a bit of atmosphere with them. We'll see. Yes. Well, thank you. I th um, that's the questions I had. And um, thank you so much for this very nice interview. And uh, thank you. really hope that uh, the, the Tampere Flood Fest will, you know, will be able to be live uh, in Finland and hopefully uh, all around the world we can join you uh, via the internet. That would be fantastic. Um, so thank you again and uh, yeah, good luck with your PhD. Uh, thank you. Process. It was lovely talking to you and lovely making your acquaintance and I hope to, that we get to meet live one day. This will be very nice, very nice.